Come on. Can you feel the vibe? Watching this, and you can hear us okay. Would you please let me know the sound is okay? I think it's okay. So, if you're on Facebook, just sort of say sound okay or something like that, or sound not okay. Can you hear me okay on Facebook? I'll wait a couple seconds for a response to that. My, well, I see it. it my graphs show that we're a little bit on the low side. If I turn up my buttons here. Let's see how that is. That's a little bit better. And okay. Again, if someone on Facebook can hear me, if you could say sound is okay, I would appreciate it. I'm saying that sound is not good. Can you hear me at all? Oh, okay. Can you hear me at all? A little bit. All righty. How about now? Is that getting better? Let's wait and see a couple seconds. That's better. That's better. Okay, so if you're on Facebook and you can hear me okay, then please let me know. I think we're okay now. We were a little bit off there for a minute. Okay, all right, now we're better. Okay, anyway, <laughs> welcome. I am very glad that you're here as always. Ahuva and I are going to be continuing with the 13 Petaled Rose. 13 Petaled Rose is by Aiden Steinsaltz. Get it balanced here. Who is one of the absolutely incredible current Jewish scholars? Uh, good, thank you, Mary and Anthony. I have one of my buttons turned too low. Um, the subname for this is a discourse on the essence of Jewish existence and belief. Um, so the book is really, really good. Um, it takes topics that shouldn't be that complicated but are often made complicated and tries to make them more simple without losing the essence some of this material is a little bit complicated anyway frankly if you're watching this live and we read something that you think you just really don't understand please feel free to ask in the chat screen and we'll try to explain it clarify it for you if you have other comments I usually try to hang out for an hour or so after the broadcast so we can talk Today, however, uh, because, of, uh, because of the holiday, we're doing a uh, program called Kavanaugh to Kapera at a local river. So we're going to need to pretty much scoot when this is over to get there. So this week, I'm not going to be able to hang out afterwards. If you have any questions or comments, I always invite you to PM me, and I'll be happy to answer them when I can. Or you can post it on this feed, and I will read back over and address everything on the feed that we haven't addressed. Okay, I think that's got us going pretty good. So, uh, we'll talk about our holiday schedule um, at the end of this broadcast. Uh, it will be a little bit different because of the High Holy Days. 
So we are beginning on page 16. Again, this is only the second broadcast of this wonderful book, so you haven't really missed much if you're new. I want to welcome Mary and Anthony and Carolyn and uh, Sherry LaCrosse and Adam and Veronica and Yosef and Gary um, and everybody else who's with us here. I'm really glad that you're here. So let's go ahead and get started. If, in our world, one needs prophetic insight or an opening of faith to distinguish the divine plenty in all its variety of forms and all of its levels, in the higher worlds everything is more lucid and offers less resistance to the divine plenty, so that in being above the other two worlds of action and formation, the world of creation is also more translucently clear. Its creatures are more fully cognizant of the matter in which this world is consistently being created as one of another manifestation of the divine plenty. I'm going to pause here just a second uh, for those who weren't with us last week. We live in the world of action. Now a lot of this is just ways to sort of comprehend these things. But above the world of action is the world of formation, or the world of formation would be the realm where the angels live and that sort of thing. Above that is the world of creation, so that's what's being discussed here. I think this will make more sense as we continue for you. So, the world of creation is also more translucently clear. Its creatures are more fully cognizant of the manner in which the world is constantly being created as one of another manifestation of the divine plenty. At the same time, since the world of creation is still a separate world, its creatures and souls have their own individual selves. They may indeed perceive the divine light, and they may fully accept its dominance in everything. Nevertheless, in feeling themselves separate from this light, they recognize their independence existence, which is to say, that even though Seraph yearns mightily to approach the divine, for despite his being far above anything man can grasp, and despite his being the embodiment of understanding and higher intelligence, he is aware that his is a reality disconnected from the divine. Remember that Hashem is absolutely everything. He is the divine one. And we're all living in worlds seeking to attain to him, which is called devahut, or attachment to God. So that's the discussion here. Uh, oh, also, there was a, one reference here that I want to make, too, is there was a comment about um, the world being constantly created. We read the beginning at Genesis, and it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew understanding is more that in the beginning of the creation, God did these things. It is not the end of creation. God is eternally creating moment by moment. Were God to stop creating, all creation would cease to exist. So this is a, a Jewish concept. It's not that God did create, it's that God is creating. Ahuva. Oh, I'm supposed to keep going here. <laughs> Sorry, we have our books marked for when we're supposed to stop. In fact, only beyond the world of creation, in the world of emanation, the highest of all worlds, which is, in a sense, no longer really a world, can one speak of such absolute clarity and transparency that no concealment of any essence whatsoever is possible, and that consequently essences do not exhibit any particular separate self at all. Only in the world of emanation is there no hiding of the revealed divinity by every fence or screen that sets things apart. This is why one may say that the world of emanation is no longer really a world, but it is itself the Godhead. Now don't misunderstand the Christian concept of a Godhead here. It's a totally different idea. The world of creation is, for all of its existence and purity, still an independent existence with its own personality, its own I, as distinct from the divine being. The difference between the world of emanation and the world of creation is thus greater than that between any other two levels. It is the edge of the whole system of independent existences, each one divided from the other by screens, and beyond it is the source of all being, where there is no screens anymore. So if you commit a sin, you're building a wall between you and Hashem. 
Hashem conceals himself from us because he is utterly holy. We are close to utterly unholy. So we, we place shields between us and God. The person who seeks to know God and serve God is a person who is removing those screens so they get a more direct view. In our world, God is very concealed. You can't see God. You can easily say, I don't believe God exists if you're of that mindset. God is very much concealed. The higher you get, the less dense that concealment comes and the more you're able to realize God's actual existence without all of this illusion that is blocking our view. So the point here is that in the highest realm, individuals still exist, but they know God. They can see God, unlike in our realm where it's very difficult. Continuing. An archetypical representation of a screen is the curtain dividing humanity's sacred from the Holy of Holies in the Holy Temple. For the Holy Temple is, in a sense, a symbolic model of the world system of the worlds, the whole system of the worlds. A screen is thus something that acts as a barrier to the free flow of divine plenty in all of its purity. It is that which brings about a curtain obscuring and modification of its light. For so long as the divine light passes through levels or planes, they are transparent. There may be an alteration of color or in form or in the quality of the revelation, but the light itself remains essentially light. But what happens when the light strikes against a screen? Even though the light may be discerned on the dark side of the screen as a result of some enlightenment, on the other side, the light itself does not penetrate. And I can give you a good example of this. If you look behind me, you'll see, blue, there, you'll see we have blue curtains on the door behind us. They look blue to you, right? They're actually not blue. They're actually brown. If you were here looking at them, those are brown. But because of the way the light comes through them, they look blue. It's an example. The idea of a screen is only an image to explain the essence of the differences among all things. In the world of emanation, in the Godhead, there are no such barriers, and the unity is complete. In order for a world to exist separate from the Godhead, there has to be a contraction of the divine essence. This contraction of infinite wisdom or withdrawal of divine plenty is therefore the basis of creation of the universe. And the screen, representing the hiddenness of the divine, is the basis for making the world manifest as separate worlds. This is a central imagery of Genesis. In the beginning was concealment and withdrawal. Darkness was on the face of the deep. But out of the darkness, which follows from the existence of the screen, the mold of a world, which will be like the world itself, can be imprinted. If you have any questions again do feel free to ask this is this is heavier stuff than we normally cover on these Sunday broadcast so let me know if you have any problem understanding this um, Mario has joined us and Slomo has joined us Yaakov and Farah has joined us um, Farah says have a sweet new year thank you Farah and all of you may you all have a sweet new year as we're approaching 5778 coming up pretty soon here thank you all and I'm a little hoover read now As for our world, the world of action, besides a physical world, it also contains a spiritual world. In fact, a rather large number of spiritual worlds. These worlds and their various mansions vary greatly, indeed so greatly that it is extremely difficult to see any unity in their spiritual significance. On the one hand, those domains of the spirit that issue from wisdom and creativity, such as philosophy, mathematics, art, poetry, and the like, which are morally or qualitatively neutral in their ideas of truth or beauty, are readily recognizable. On the other hand, there are domains of the spirit that have a certain Gnostic significance with a different value system and that thus lend themselves to either a positive or negative spirituality. For just as there is room for both physical and spiritual functioning of all kinds that raise the world and man to higher levels of holiness in the world of action, so there is also that which makes contact between the world of human beings and those worlds lower than ours. These worlds are called realms of evil, the worlds of 
the Kelipa, the outer shell. The domains of the Kelipa, uh, the Klipa constitute mansions, and in them too, there are hierarchical systems, one above another, actually one beneath the other, with the evil becoming more emphatic and more obvious with each distinct level. And as may be surmised, there is a strong interrelation with the world of action. For although in itself the world of action is neutral in terms of its Gnostic implication, it belongs to the worlds of evil, to one of the levels of the outer shell called Klipa Noga. This is a level of being containing all that is not in its essence directed either toward or against holiness. In terms of holiness, then, it holds a neutral position. Nevertheless, when man sinks into this neutral position entirely without disentangling himself from all... Let me try that again. Without disentangle, disentangling himself at all from it, he fails to realize his specific human destiny and is found wanting in the very core of his being. Okay, so I want to try to make that a little bit clearer, I think. Um, many of you, probably most of you, know about Yetzir Tov and Yetzir Hara. We are born with a dual impulse, an impulse towards goodness and selflessness and an impulse towards darkness and selfishness. Those who attend to the higher spheres are those people who are attending to Yetzir Tov, the good path. Those who attend to the lower spheres are those who are attending to Yetzir Hara, the negative selfish spheres. This is another way to think about this. This is what's being discussed here. Humans have been placed pretty much in the center of this dynamic where we can go either upward or lower. We have the free choice to choose. That's really what we're discussing here in different words. Beneath the domain of Klipa Noga are the thoroughly evil worlds. Each one of them has its own aspect of evil and, is, and as is the case with the worlds of holiness, is dynamically connected to the others by the bonds of transformation between worlds and planes in a process that continues down to the very lowest depth of evil. As in all worlds, so in the realms of evil, manifestation takes three forms, worlds, year, and soul. In other words, there's a general background of existence acting as place in the spiritual sense, world. There's an aspect connected with the relation to time and causality, year. And likewise, they have a soul aspect, that is, spiritual creatures inhabiting the worlds of evil. These beings inhabiting the worlds of evil are also called angels, but they are rather subversive angels, angels of destruction. And like the angels of higher worlds, they are also spiritual beings and are limited each to a well-defined essence and each to its own purpose. Just as there is in the domain of holiness the quality or angel of love and holiness, of awe in holiness and the like, so there are contrasting emanations and impulses in the domain of evil, angels of destruction expressing love in wickedness, fear in corruption, and the like. Several of you have written me asking me about angels and demons and all that, and I will tell you that we don't believe in demons, but then you'll say, yeah, but, and you're right, we do actually believe in them, but we don't believe in them in the, in the Christian context, in the Christian sense of the term. These beings do exist, but as Ahuva just read, they exist within very strictly controlled confines. We humans are not subject to them in the sense of evil beings leading us into destruction, so to speak. Um, it's a different cosmogonical setup with Judaism. I want to welcome um, Stephen, yeah, the Gilgulam, right, right. I want to uh, welcome Stephen and Ibrahim, Hanna, Benes, and Sylvia. Welcome. Um, Mario, glad that you're here. Yaakov, I don't think I already welcomed you. Glad that you're here if I did anyway. And, oh, my friend Wayne Jones is here. Hi, Wayne. Glad that you're here too. All right. So we are again reading the 13 petaled Rose. We are on page 20, and we will be continuing. Some of these pernicious angels... <laughs> I like that, pernicious angels. Some of these pernicious angels are self-sufficient beings with clearly defined and specific characters whose existence is, in a certain sense, eternal, at least until such time as evil will vanish from the face of the earth. In addition, there are subversive angels created by the actions of men, 
by the objectification of malevolence, the evil thought, the hate-inspired wish, the wicked deed. Again, this is Yetzirhara. For besides its visibly destructive consequences, every act of malice or evil creates an abstract Gnostic being who is a bad angel, an angel belonging to the plane of evil corresponding to the state of mind that brought it into being. This word Gnostic, by the way, needs to be understood. Uh, it's not referring to the ancient Gnostic doctrines. What it's talking about is hidden. Gnostic is something that is hidden. So these beings are hidden from our views and can only be understood by certain metaphysical type of uh, conceptions. Continuing. In their inner essence, however, the creatures of the realms of evil are not independent entities living by their own forces. Their existence is contingent on our world. That is to say, they receive their vital power from our world. Their source, which they can do no more than copy in various ways on progressively lower planes. Just as it is true from higher worlds that it is man and only man who is able to choose to perform good, Yetzir Tov, so too it is only man who can choose to do evil. So the devil didn't make me buy this dress, to paraphrase Flip Wilson, if you remember that old, that old comedian. It is our choice. To do good or to do evil is your choice. The devil did not make you do it. Continuing, sorry about that. Whatever man does, in turn, creates and gives forth an abundance of life. His whole spiritual being is involved in such an act. And the angel formed thereby accompanies him as his handiwork, as part of the existence encircling him. Like the angels of holiness, the angels of destruction are, to a degree, channels to transfer the plenty that, as is transmuted from our world, descends the stairs of, corrobor of corruption level after level to the lowest depths of the worlds of abomination. Remember the Jacob's ladder in the Torah? Jacob is there and he sees the angels ascending and descending. This is the same symbolism here. Not only do those angels ascend to Hashem and then descend to him with messages from Hashem, they're created by his prayers and by his struggle. So, too, there are angels that descend and ascend back to man. We are the creators of those types of angels. This is a critical difference. We are empowered by Hashem, by our free will, to choose to create good angels or bad angels. They carry out our will so that we can experience life in the material manifestation and experience so that we can finally learn that only submission to Hashem, only devahut, only attachment to Hashem brings us true happiness. How can I know that if I never got to go on my own? Kids are well known because they'll leave home and they'll get into rebellion and stuff. That's what kids do. Hopefully, the kid will understand, you know what? Mom and dad maybe weren't so nuts after all. And they rectify and live their life. Same way Hashem lets us go nuts sometimes if we want to, we can follow our own pursuits. The angels empower that to happen. So again, it's a very different concept than other religions have. Continuing. It follows that these worlds of evil are in conjunction with and directly upon man. That means all people. Whether in natural, concrete forms or in abstract spiritual forms. The subversive angels are thus also tempters and inciters to evil because they bring the knowledge of evil from their world to ours. And at the same time, the more evil a human being does, the more life force do these angels draw from him for our world. But on the other hand, these same subversive angels also serve as instruments for punishing the sinner. For the sinner is punished by the inevitable consequences of his deeds, just as a sadic or saint receives his reward in the consequences of his benevolent deeds. In short, the sinner is punished by the closing of the circle, by being brought into contact with the domain of evil that he himself creates. The subversive angels are revealed in a variety of forms, in both material and spiritual ways. And in their revelation, they punish man for his sins in this world of ours. 
making him suffer torment and pain, defeat and anguish, physically as well as spiritually. The subversive angels act in one sense as manifestations or messengers of evil, and yet in another sense they constitute a necessary part of the totality of existence. Again, they make our free will possible. For although, like the worlds of evil in general, the subversive angels are not ideal beings, they nevertheless have a role in our world, enabling it to function as it does. To be sure, were the world to root out all evil completely, then, as a matter of course, the subversive angels would simply disappear, since they exist as a permanent parasite living on man. But as long as man chooses evil, he supports and nurtures the whole world and mission of evil. All of them drawing upon the same human sickness of soul. In fact, these worlds and mansions of evil even stir up the sickness itself and are integral to the pain and sufferings they cause. In this sense, the very origin of the demons is conditioned by factors they influence, like a police force whose existence is useful and necessary only because of the existence of crime. The spiritual implication of the subversive angels constitutes, in addition to their negative function, a framework tended to keep the world from sliding into evil. Um, let's see, welcome to Cast, who has joined us on Facebook. Uh, from Peru, it looks like, and uh, Yanti is here, welcome, and um, I, I welcome Wayne, glad that you're here, Wayne. So, this is the point, I really, this needs to be understood. It's not that demons are these separate beings who come to draw us into Satan's realm and all that. That's not the purpose. The purpose is we've got free will. We are in control. We're in the driver's seat. If I want to disobey God, if I want to disobey Torah, I can do that. If I need this structure to help me do it, I can create angels that or demons in that sense, though we use the word angels for both, but I can create angels that will help me do that. If I want to know Hashem, I can create angels that will help me know Hashem. If all of humanity would simply go to Hashem, as we will once Mashiach bin David comes, then the demons will have no more reason to exist and will simply be gone because we created them. Wayne says, I cannot hear nothing yet. Sorry, I'm still trying. Okay, Wayne, I think it is probably on your system because everyone else is hearing me. So good luck with your settings. Um, but so this is very important to understand. The Jewish idea, demons do not exist in the sense that Christianity and Islam proclaims them. They don't exist. But they do exist in this sense, in according to Jewish understanding and biblical understanding. And we'll go back to Ahuva. The fact remains, however, that these angels grow in strength and power, constantly reinforced by the growing evil in the world. Their existence is thus two-sided and ambiguous. On one hand, the main reason for their creation is to serve as a deterrent and as a limit, and in this sense they are a necessary part of the overall system of worlds. On the other hand, as the evil flourishes and spreads over the world because of the deeds of men, these destructive angels become increasingly independent existences, making up a whole realm that feeds on and fattens on evil. Whereupon the very reason for this realm is forgotten, and it appears to have become evil for its own sake, an end in itself, at which point, in the paradox, the vastness and magnificent scope of the purpose and meaning of man becomes evident. We see that man can liberate himself from the accumulating temptation of evil, by which act he compels the world of evil to shrink to their original mold. What is more, he's able to change these worlds completely so that they can be included in the system of the worlds of the holy, which occurs when that part of them which had become corrupt disappears completely, and that part of them which had served as a support and as a deterrent assumes an entirely different character. Nevertheless, so long as the world remains as it is, the subversive angels continue to exist within their very substance of the world of action, 
and even in domains above it, finding a place for themselves wherever there is any inclination towards the evil. But this happens because they themselves instigate and provoke the production of evil. Thus they receive their life and power as the result of something they have aroused. And then finally, by their very existence, they constitute a punishment for the things which they have helped to bring about. The worlds and the mansions of evil belong in this sense to the general framework of the world of action, and one of their most extreme aspects is that mansion called hell in all its forms. For when the soul of man leaves the body and can relate directly to spiritual essences, thus becoming altogether spiritual with no more than fragmented memories of having been connected with the body, then in the course of things all that this soul has done in life casts it into its right form on the level appropriate to it in the life after death. And therefore the soul of the sinner descends as it is symbolically expressed to hell. In other words, the soul now finds itself wholly within the world domain of those subversive angels whom, as a sinner, it created. And there is no refuge from them, for these creatures encompass the soul completely and keep punishing it with full, exacting punishment for having produced them, for having caused the existence of those same angels. And as long as the just measure of anguish is not exhausted, this soul remains in hell. Which is to say, the soul is punished not by something extraneous, but by that manifestation of evil it itself created according to its level and according to its essence. Only after the soul passes through the sickness, torment, and pain of the spiritual existence of its own self-produced evil, only then can it reach a higher level of being in accordance with its correct state and in accordance with the essence of the good it created. Since even this domain of the worlds of evil is fundamentally inward and spiritual, it is revealed only by way of vision of one kind or another. And therefore, the many anthropomorphic descriptions of the subversive angels are not unlike the description of the holy angels in their crudity and their clumsy approximations. For it is not given to transmit something that does not lend itself to material description, and the imagery used is invariably inadequate. And that, by the way, is a vitally, vitally, vitally important point. <clears throat> People talk about you know, God sitting on a throne, God having a right hand, of, and all this kind of stuff. This is all symbolism and metaphor. I want to read what she just read again, because it's really, really important. Therefore, the many anthropomorphic descriptions of the subversive angels are not unlike the descriptions of the holy angels in their crudity and their clumsiness and their clumsy approximations. For it is not given to transmit something that does not lend itself to material description, and the imagery used is inevitably inadequate. We do not understand these things, they are above us. We're trying to understand things in rational terms that are, transcend our understanding. Not, I mean, Hoover was very clear, but I wanted to re just reiterate that point, because that's very, very important. A lot of us think we know the answers. We know everything. We don't know squat. We have some approximations, but we don't know. Once Mashiach is here, we're going to find out that all of us were wrong on a lot of points. And hopefully we've been right on some points. May Hashem be merciful. That ends chapter 1. Um, let's go ahead and begin chapter 2, Divine Manifestation. Hopefully now we'll get on to a little bit more upbeat topic than, than demons and the like. The Holy One, this is on page 25, by the way, if you have the book and you're reading along. The Holy One, blessed be He, has any number of names. All of these names, however, designate only various aspects of divine manifestation in the world. In particular, are those made known to human beings. Above and beyond these, very, these variety of designations is the divine essence itself which has not and cannot have a name. We call this essence or God in himself by a name that is itself a paradox. The infinite, blessed be he. This term then is meant to apply to the divine essence in itself 
which cannot be called by any other name, since the only name that can be applied to the very essence of God must include both the distant and the near, indeed everything. Now, as we know, in the realms of abstract thought, such as mathematics or philosophy, infinity is, which is that which is beyond measure and beyond grasp, while at the same time the term is limited by its very definition to being a quality of something finite. Thus, for example, there are many things in the world, such as numbers, that may have infinity as one of their attributes, and yet also is limited either in function or purpose, or in their very nature. But when we speak of the infinite, blessed be he, we mean the utmost of perfection and abstraction, that which encompasses everything and beyond all possible limits. Incidentally, there, he's using an English translation for the term. The term is actually Ein Sof. Ein Sof translates as the infinite or the no thing which is conceivable, therefore it is infinite. So we're talking about the Ein Sof here for those familiar with this. The whole thing we are permitted to say about Ein Sof or the infinite then would involve the negative of all qualities. For the infinite is beyond anything that can be grasped in any terms, either positive or negative. Not only is it impossible to say of the infinite that he is in any way limited or that he is bad, one cannot even say the opposite, that he is vast or that he is good. Just as he is not matter, he is not spirit. He can be said to exist in any dimension meaningful to us. The dilemma posed by this meaning of infinity is more than a consequence of the inadequacy of the human mind. It represents a simply unbridgeable gap, a gap that cannot be crossed by anything definable. So we're talking about the nature of God here. Who is God? What is God? If God is what we all say he is, he, and he's not a he, because he could be a she, he could be both, God is indefinable. God blows our mind. God is beyond any conception. Continuing. There would therefore seem to be an abyss stretching between God and the world, and not only the physical world of time, space, and gravity, but also the spiritual worlds. No matter how sublime, confined as each one is within the boundaries of its own definition, creation itself becomes a divine paradox. To bridge the abyss, the infinite keeps creating the world. Remember I said earlier that it's not that God created, it's that God is creating. To bridge this abyss, the infinite keeps creating the world. His creation being not the act of forming something out of nothing, ex nihilo, but the act of revelation. Creation is an emanation from the divine light. In its secrets is not coming into existence, is not the coming into existence of something new, but the transmutation of the divine reality into something defined and limited, into a world. This transmutation involves a process or a mystery of contraction. In other words, God hides himself, putting aside his essential infiniteness and withholding his endless light to the extent necessary in order that the worlds may exist. Within the actual divine light, nothing can maintain its own existence. The world becomes possible only through the special act of divine withdrawal or contraction. Such divine non-being or concealment is thus the elementary condition for the existence of that which is finite. Still, even though it appears as an entity in itself, the world is formed and sustained by the divine power manifested in this primal essence. The manifestation takes the form of ten spherot, fundamental forces or channels of divine flow. And these spherot, 
which are the means of divine revelation, are related to the primary divine light as a body is related to the soul. They are in the nature of an instrument or a vehicle of expression, as though a mode of creation in another dimension of existence. Or the ten sephirot or spherot can also be seen as an arrangement or configuration resembling an upright human figure, each of whose main limbs corresponds to one of the spherot. The world does not, therefore, relate directly to the hidden Godhead, which in this imagery is like the soul in relation to the human semblance of the spherot. Rather, it relates to the divine manifestation, when and how this manifestation occurs in the ten spherot. Just as man's true soul, his inapprehensible self, is never revealed to others, but manifests itself through the mind, emotions, and body, so is the self of God not revealed in his original essence, except through the ten spherot. The ten sephirot taken together constitute a fundamental and all-inclusive reality. Moreover, the pattern of this reality is organic. Each of the spherot has a unique function, complements each of the others, and is essential for the realization or fulfillment of the others and of the whole. Because of their profound many-sidedness, the ten spherot seem to be shrouded in mystery, and there are indeed so many apparently unconnected levels of meaning to each, the levels moreover appearing to be unconnected, that a mere listing of their names does not adequately convey their essence. To say that the first sphera, keter, crown, is the basic divine will and also the source of all delight and pleasure only touches the surface. As is true with hokma wisdom, which is intuitive, instantaneous knowledge, while bina understanding tends more to logical analysis, dot knowledge is different from both, being not only the accumulation of the summation of that which is known, but a sort of eleventh spherot, sphera belonging and yet not belonging to the ten. Chesed, grace, is thus the fourth sphera, and is the irrepressibly expanding impulse, or gedula, greatness, of love and growth. Gevura, power, is restraint and concentration, control, as well as fear and awe. While tefirat, beauty, is the combination of harmony, truth, and compassion. Netzach, eternity, is conquest, or the capacity for overcoming. Hod, splendor, can also be seen as persistence or holding on. And Yesod, foundation, is, among other things, the vehicle, the carrier, from one thing or condition to another. Malchut, kingdom, is the tenth and last sphera, and is, besides sovereignty or rule, the word and the ultimate receptacle. He then spells out the ten words which you see on your screen in that order. All these spherot are infinite in their potency, even though they are finite in their essence. They never appear separately, each in its pure state, but always in some sort of combination in a variety of forms. And every single combination or detail of such a combination expresses a different revelation. The great sum of all these sephirot in their relatedness constitutes the permanent connection between God and his world. This connection actually operates two ways, for the world can respond and even act on its own. On the one hand, the ten sephirot are responsible for the universal law and order, what we, call, what we might call the workings of nature in the world. As such, they mix and descend, contracting and changing forms as they go from one world to another, until they reach our physical world, which is the final station of the manifestation of divine power. But on the other hand, the events that occur in our world continuously influence the ten sephirot, affecting the nature quality of the, river of the relations between the downpouring of light and power and the recipients of, the, of this light and power. 
An old alleged allegory illustrates this influence by depicting the world as a small island in the middle of a sea, inhabited by birds. To provide them with sustenance, the king has arranged an, an intricate network of, cha of channels through which the necessary food and water flow. So long as the birds behave as they are endowed by nature to behave, singing and soaring through the air, the air uh, and flow, uh, the flow of plenty proceeds without an eruption. But when the birds begin to play in the dirt and peck at the channels, then the channels get blocked or broken or cease to function properly, and the flow from above is disrupted. So too does the island that is our world depend on the proper functioning of the sephirot. And when they are interfered with, the system is disrupted, and the disrupting factors themselves suffer the consequences. In this sense, the entire order of the sephirot, with its laws of actions and reactions, is in many ways mechanical. Nevertheless, man, who is the only creature capable of free action in the system, can cause alterations of varying degrees in the patterns of the operation. For everything man does has significance. An evil act will generally cause some disruption or negative reaction in the vast system of the sephirot, and a good act correct or rise things to a higher level. Each of the reactions extends out into all the world and comes back into our own, back upon ourselves in one form or another. In this vast sublime order, the mitzvot, study and practice of Torah, the mitzvot are basically are our actions, our observance of Torah law and the good deeds that we do and so on. Study and practice of Torah, prayer, love, repentance, constitute only details or guidelines. The mitzvot teach us how, to, how certain acts, thoughts, and ways of doing things affect the sephirot and bring about a desirable combination of blessedness and plenty, making the world better. In fact, before the performance of every mitzvah, there are certain words that are said aloud, words intended to cause a great abundance in the flow in form of the higher worlds in order to illuminate our souls, which means that every mitzvah has a specific essence through which it influences the system of the world and creates a certain kind of connection between the world and humanity. Thus, even though from many points of view our world is small, it can be seen as the point of intersection of all the other worlds, principally because of this power of human beings, creatures possessed of free will, to change the fixed order of things. It is as though our world were a kind of control room from which the ten sephirot in the various possible combinations can be made to operate. Hey, I was talking earlier about the significance of free will. This really is the point here. We have free will. Hashem has granted us free will. We choose. We choose what we're going to do. We choose the power that we're going to have. You want Messiah? Observe the mitzvot. You want Messiah? Pray for Messiah. You want the mitzvot? Observe Torah. It's up to us. It is in our hands. We can bring Messiah at any time. If the Jews will simply come together and observe two Shabbats properly, if all the Jews will simply repent, and this is a perfect time of year to do it. We're at the very end of Elul getting ready for the High Holy Days. If we would seriously, if we would take Yom Kippur seriously and seriously repent, Hashem would send the Messiah shortly. We have that power. And that's what's being discussed here. This is how we access that power. We're going to go ahead and conclude here. Uh, where did we stop at? Up there. Uh, we're going to end on page 31 for today, and we'll, we'll continue on next week. I'm ending a little bit earlier because we have to go somewhere. Uh, as we're approaching the High Holy Days, we have, we're going to have in the park today what's called Kavanah to Kapara, um, 
that is going to be uh, observed on the um, on the river downtown. So Jews from the area are going to get together for a time of personal reflection and teshuva at a public park. Uh, so we're, we have to go to be there. So I want to thank you all for being here as always. Um, this, uh, because of the High Holy Days, our schedule is going to be a little bit different for the live broadcast. I've got it posted on my Facebook page, but you're going to have to scroll down to September 14th to see it. Um, the, um, all right, so because of Erev Rosh Hashanah, which is uh, September 20th, I will not be doing the Wednesday class on the One God, Seven Laws broadcast. No Wednesday class because of Erev Rosh Hashanah. And then Thursday is Rosh Hashanah's first day, day one, 921. So there will be no Thursday class when we study Hit Dut through Rabbi Shalom Arush's wonderful book in Forest Fields. Um, and then day two is 922. I don't do classes on that day, so it doesn't matter. Um, the following Sunday, which will be next Sunday, is uh, Kevravot or Tishlach. And so there are Tashlich, depending on how you want to pronounce it. So there'll be no Sunday class next Sunday. We'll be um, at a local water hole, watering hole here. So for, because of Tishlach, Tashlik, no, no, no class next Sunday. Um, then on 9-27, September 27th at 8 p.m., we will be doing One God, Seven Laws live broadcast on that group. If you're not a member of the group One God, Seven Laws, I encourage you to join us. Uh, I can't broadcast that group live on my Facebook personal wall. So if you want to see it, you have to go there to be live. Once I complete it, I then post it over to my main wall. On 9-28, which is a Thursday, we will be doing in Forest Fields again. Uh, and then Kol Nidre is going to be uh, Erev Yom Kippur, which will be September 29th. Um, so, again, that's a Friday. There's no classes anyway. Yom Kippur will be 9.30, which is a Shabbat, so obviously no classes. When we get into Sukkot, um, which will be October 4th, um, Wednesday is the beginning of Sukkot, October 4th, so there will be no Wednesday class on October 4th. No One God, Seven Laws class October 4th, because that will be the first day of Sukkot. I'm going to wait and announce my Sukkot schedule um, we'll see. What I've done before when we lived in California is I was able to hook up my computer in our sukkah and do my live broadcast from the sukkah. The way we're set up here, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do that, frankly. So as Sukkot gets closer, I'll let you know what the schedule is for that. Um, however, on October 11th, which is the final day of Sukkot, there will not be a Wednesday class of One God, Seven Laws on October 11th either. Um, I'll move this up further up on my Facebook when I get a chance so you can see them a little bit better. But that's my High Holy Day schedule. Um, Rabbi A at the House of Seven Beggars said that he would be posting his schedule um, today. I haven't looked over there to see it. Usually the House of Seven Beggars does live services for the High Holy Days. I don't know for sure what he's doing. But if you go to um, sevenbeggars.com, you'll see what uh, the House of Seven Beggars is going to be offering throughout the High Holy Days. Um, okay, that actually took not as long as I thought. We do have about five or six minutes left. If you have any questions, we'll be able to look at those a little bit. Um, so does anyone have any questions or comments before we finish up here? Let's see. High Holy Days, September 10th. Okay, here's Rabbi's schedule. Um, no, no, it's not either. Okay, Rabbi hasn't posted his yet. But if you go to sevenbeggars.com, you'll see Rabbi A's um, schedule for the House of Seven Beggars. It's not up yet. He told me by p.m. he was planning on putting it up today, so it should be up later today. Um, Jerry says, thank you. You are more than welcome. Mary 
says that she really likes the 13 petal rose thank you mary so do i i was really hesitant to do it because like i say this is a lot deeper than we usually get with these classes but i've had so many people asking it's not really good for non-observant jews to study kabbalah in too much depth because you really need to have a foundational understanding to be able to understand what's going on with it but I got so many questions, I thought, you know, this is a good book, and this, I think, will give you that foundational stuff that you're looking for. Anthony says, thank you. I hope you have a nice New Year. You too, Anthony. Thank you very much. Mary uh, Rourke, welcome. Glad that you were able to make it. Andrew joined us. Welcome. Jerry joined us. Um, Lillian asked about my health and said, I hope you're doing okay. Let me give you a basic update on that. Uh, there isn't one. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a short version. Um, I went in for what I thought was just going to be routine screening for a test that I haven't had done before, and I wasn't expecting anything to come out of it. Um, to my surprise, um, the, uh, the local hospital here found three areas that they think may be cancerous. One, if they are, would be colon cancer, one would be a cancer of the esophagus, and the other would be some form of stomach cancer. So they did biopsies on things that they removed from those three places. They were supposed to let me know by yes by Friday um, what the results were. We called and said we'd really like to know. And uh, they said they'd have somebody call us by the end of the day, but alas, they didn't. So for now, I'm still waiting around. Um, I could have cancer in one of or one, two, or three of three parts of my body. I sincerely, obviously, hope that's not the case. Um, we do know that Hashem controls everything. And so if it is Hashem's will that I need cancer for my soul correction, then I accept it. Um, I am praying that that is not what I need. But Hashem will never give us anything that is not for our ultimate good. Hashem is in control. I'm honestly not overly concerned about it. Um, I'm a little bit more concerned because it's three separate scary biopsies, frankly. I, three sort of like ups your chance, I think. But, um, but you know, Hashem is in control. Um, as a lot of you guys who have been with me for years know, um, I had a heart attack uh, three years ago, about, and um, went to the hospital. The head of cardiology said, saw me, said, looked at the test and said, you definitely had a heart attack. You're going to have to have one stent. I went into the hospital a couple of days later. He upped it and said, you're probably going to need three or four stents. They put me on the table. They did the cath thing that they do to get ready for the surgery. And when he was looking at my heart, he stopped the surgery and said, you know what? There's nothing wrong with you. You've got the heart of a much younger person even. Um, why did that happen? It happened for one reason and one reason only as far as I'm concerned. Hi, Kathy Iverster. Glad that you're here. We lived across the street from each other's kids. Um... Glad that you're here. Um, it happened for only one reason. That one reason was that when I left the hospital the first day, I came home. Immediately I went on Facebook and I posted what was going on and I asked you guys to pray. I had an estimated 5,000 people, including three Christian churches and a couple of synagogues, added me to their Misha Barak list, at least a couple. I don't actually know how many people I had praying. That's why I did. That's why Hashem healed my heart attack. I went back to the doctor for a checkup, and he said. Um, so I said, so basically, what happened to the heart attack? Because I'm sort of, you know, what's he going to say? He said, well, you didn't have a heart attack. And I said, well, you're the head of cardiology, and you said I did. And he said, well, if you do, then you have to have these evidences that you don't have. I said, so it was a miracle. And he sort of smiled and said, well, well, it was probably gas. <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, I know what heartburn is like. I've had it for years. Uh, in fact, I now have, what do they call the Russell thing? Barrett's esophagus now, thank you. Didn't I, I need that. Uh, <laughs> but most of, much of my life, Hashem has given me these physical things to deal with. Um, so um, if I have cancer, Hashem can take care of that too if it's his will. If it, I pray that it is. I'm waiting for the results. I appreciate your prayers. I ask you to continue praying for me uh, until I get the results, uh, which hopefully will be Monday, tomorrow. When I do, I'll be posting them on the top of my Facebook feed and letting everybody know. Um, but 
seriously, we are taught by Rabbi Nachman of Breslov and our other great rabbinic authorities that every single thing that happens to us comes from God. When we were reading today in the 13 Petal Rose, we discussed that a little bit, how as you get to higher levels, you become to realize that everything is dependent on Hashem. And we don't understand everything that happens, but it's always dependent on Hashem, and that Hashem always acts for our ultimate good, our soul correction. Hashem always acts to remove those screens so that we can come closer and closer to attaining devachut, or attachment to Hashem. So everything that happens comes from Hashem. Everything that happens, happens for our ultimate good, individually and collectively as a people. And everything that happens can be utilized for our spiritual growth if we accept that it comes from Hashem. So whatever happens, Baruch Hashem. God did it. Praise God. Um, and again, I will let you know what Hashem decides when I know, which hopefully will be sometime tomorrow. All right. Thank you all for this. Um, we are going to go ahead and run for our Kavanaugh to Kapara service at the, um, up at the river in uh, downtown Ch Chattanooga. Well, thank you again, and uh, may God bless you. May God keep you. May God cause his face to smile evermore upon you. The version of Hagen Nagila that I started with, I hope you'll enjoy it. Now I'm going to play the whole thing for you. Judaism is alive, and some of our classics like Hava Nagila have to be updated to keep up with the times. I, I really like this version a lot. Thanks for watching, friends. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to post them, and I will see you next time. God bless. <laughs>
And thank you, friends. I'll see you next time. May God bless you in everything that you do. And have a wonderful, wonderful new year if I don't talk to you till then. God bless.